let me make a couple of comments about the um, homework assignment. <clears throat> um, how's the homework going? Okay, so far. Uh, number one, getting the uh, symbol for a particular, or getting the uh, entree and ensemble information and the go information, which I'll talk about today for a particular gene you can use. I, I think the, the code that's in the R bioconductor um, script file. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go through some of that code and give you some tips today. And then we'll talk also about this um, topic at the on the last problem. Remember that I've made this last problem, number 2E, optional. <clears throat> I will talk about how to do it um, today, but you don't have to do it for the, for the homework. It takes a little bit of um, customization to use the top go package uh, for our purposes. I'll give you some tips. Yes. Just the input R code would be fine. So uh, what it might look like is um, like a Word document or whatever your preferred thing is. Uh, number one A answer is dot dot dot. Number two or number one B answer is dot dot dot. And then at the end of the document, put code. Just copy paste all the code that you use. That way we can look through and see what you did. So let me um, let me start here. <clears throat> Annotation databases. We talked about this last time, um, <clears throat> and this Affymetrix microarray <clears throat> is one kind of technology for getting bioinformatic data, <clears throat> and specifically, these uh, microarrays will give us a number for each of lots of um, features, in this case it's going to, where each feature is going to be a gene, <clears throat> and the number quantifies somehow, kind of vaguely, but it does quantify, at least relatively speaking, the activity level of each gene. Think of it as quantifying the number of RNA copies floating around for a given gene. And we can go spot by spot on this little chip thousands and thousands of spots. Each spot or well corresponds to one gene. And so we're going to get one number for each of these microarrays that we make for each of the genes. So thinking in terms of a data set, I'll just call it X for our data set. Let's say it is uh, M by N. M rows, N columns, and we can generically represent it like X11, X21, dot, 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 XM1, out here to X1N, X2N, dot, 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 XMN, where uh, this would be gene 1, the N numbers for gene 1. That would be gene two. This would be gene M. <clears throat> so on one of these affymetrix microarrays, there's thousands. M is tens of thousands. We have tens of thousands of genes on the uh, array. For each individual in our um, sample, in our study, we have one of these. That is individual one. This is individual n. Okay. <clears throat> so back here, what we um, are doing is saying uh, 
uh, I want to know more about what exactly is at each well on one of these Pathometrics microarrays. And let me run this code here. I'm going to library in this package that we installed, um, hgu133a.tv. And that is a, a database or an, uh, a package, an R package, that is specific to what we are doing here. It gives us the, um, the codes, what genes are located where for this specific type of Affymetrics array. There's different types of arrays. So if you're doing um, microarray based data analysis, you can look at um, this link right here actually. I think will tell us all of the databases that are available. This uh, Affymetrics Human Genome 133 is one that you can purchase from Affymetrics. Obviously it's only applicable if you're studying humans. So if you were studying mice, there'd be a different uh, array that you would get. And if you were wanting to get the, the genes that are on the wells for that mouse array, you'd need to come in the bioconductor and point to the right place. That link that I just copied into the browser shows me all of the annotation packages that are available. And there's a bunch of them. If I scroll down to HGU, there's, there's the one that we're playing with. So this is annotation for the Affymetrics Human Genome U133. And again, if you're using something different, it would be searching for that one in here. Like here's a, uh, here is a, a database like the one we're playing with, but it's for a, uh, a fly, a fruit fly. So if you're studying fruit fly, this would be the array wanted to know the genes that are located on each spot in the piece. So here, for the humans, I'm going to library in the right annotation package. And when we did that, um, if I do, if I want to know like what's in the package that I just installed, one way to get information on that is to say help package equals package name. I think this does it. And it brings up kind of a an overview help file uh, that lists all of the uh, functions and data sets and everything that are in that package. So here is what is in that particular package, the hgu133a.tv. Um, Okay, there's different things in here. These different objects are ways to map between the Affymetrix probe set IDs and other types of IDs. For example, the first thing that we did was pick out this um, object from this package, HGU-133A Entree ID. HGU-133A Entree ID is the map between the Affymetrics probe set identifiers and Entree gene ID. There's Entree, there's Ensemble, there's um, HG and C, all these different ways to identify which gene we're talking about. If I want specifically to figure out for each of the wells on this array, which Entree ID does that correspond to? then this is the, the object I want to talk to. In your homework, um, or just generally, you might want a different type of code, like in your homework, you can cut a corner if you use this object instead, because this object talks between the probe set IDs and H, G, and C symbols. So if you are doing... Um, In um, number two, part B, if you want to know, basically look up BRCA1 and HG and C symbol on this array, 
then what we've done in this code is go between Appometrics probe set arrays and entree IDs. And you know how from what's above you go between entree IDs and HG and C symbols. So you could search mimicking this exact code. You could find where's BRCA1 in terms of its entree ID. Uh, or if you pointed um, directly to this instead, you could look up BRCA1 just as the HG and C symbol. I'll show you how to do that in one second here. Let me run this one more time and remind or tell you a little more about what's happening here. I'm picking out this object and I'm giving it my own name. I didn't have to do that, but I gave it my own name. And then this mapped keys function, um, think of it like connecting the, the actual dots between the probe set IDs and the entree IDs that are in here. So it's really kind of like a pre-processing step to get things set up. And once we've run this, let me run these two lines of code and see what comes out. What is mapped probes? I'm going to ask for its class. It is a character. Uh, before I just print it off, I'd like to know a little more about it, so let's do how long it is. What is its length? So it has almost 20,000 elements. Um, I'd like to take a peek at the first few just to see what this looks like, so I'm going to do mapped probes. Just show me the first 10 elements. And that's what it is. So mapped probes contains the um, probe set IDs, each of those are the codes for, on the Affymetrix array, contains the, the probes that each of the entree IDs map to. So I have all of the probe set IDs in this object. There's 20,000 of them. Okay, and then Affy entree by what is that? What is the class of Affy Entree? So this is one of those that's not as easy to actually look at because it's of a special class. What is the class? It is of a, a special annotation DBI, so it has some special structure behind the scenes. If I type, um, if I type Affy Entree, what do I get? Not very helpful stuff. So. To learn what's in Affy Entree, it's helpful to read the, uh, the manual for this package. And I got this command out of the manual for this package. So if I do this, if I take that Affy Entree object and I bracket, square bracket to like subset. Remember that if I have a, a vector or a matrix in R and I use, I can use square brackets to pick out a um, subset of it. Yes. It is. So if I were, I could have just said um, print that. Oh no, I'm sorry, not that. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. So really, um, I think the fact that I named this and assigned it to something is just uh, an artifact of having copied an example of what somebody else has done. Um, I might call this Affy Entree in this case. If I was doing the homework and I wanted to look up a symbol, I might call this Affy underscore symbol just for my own internal use. But I could, I, I could not, I could have done without this object named Affy Entree altogether. I could have just used this. In Affy Entree, or in this object, is the, the mapping between probe set IDs and the um, Entree IDs. This right here contains all the probe set IDs. And it turns out that if you subset the Affy Entree object by 
the probe set names. You get out uh, this. Let me do this that's inside here first. So I'm going to take the first five probe set codes, one through five, just the first five, and look those up in this appy entree object. And we get something that's not easy to see. Again, appealing to the uh, reference manual, if I turn that into a list, it becomes easy to see and inspect. So I'm going to do as.list. What is a list, by the way? Um, if I say x is 1 and 4 and 0 and minus 2, x is a vector. Class x is a numeric vector. Um, a vector has to have all the elements inside of it of the same class or type. Those all need to be numbers. If I tried to say x is 1, 4, 0, hello, then it does what it the best it knows how to do, which in this case is force them all to be of the same class. So that, that 1 in the first element is not a number anymore. It's, a, it's like a, a character. So now x is a character vector. So you're limited if you want to represent data in terms of like one object that's one vector. Similarly, if you want to make a, a matrix, like if you have a, an Excel spreadsheet, you have a, for, a column for uh, name of the person in the study. You have a column for age. You have a column for income and stuff like that. If you tried to represent that in R as a matrix, I want uh, 20 rows for each of my individuals, and then I have a column for age, a column for name, and all these different things. Because those variables are not all of the same type, you had um, a numerical variable, but you also had a qualitative variable, you'll have issues like this when you try to turn that into a matrix. There's another type of object called a list, and it's more flexible. <clears throat> so if I do this, for example, list, uh, create a list, and I want it to have an element that is the number one, and an element that is the number four, the number zero, but then I also want to have something that's not a number. Then X, uh, a list can do that. A list is... Um, a, a string or an array of elements and what's unique about it is that each element can be its own thing. So I have a character in the fourth element and I have a number in the third element. This could be a data set. This could be a text, you know, like a string or something like that. A list is very flexible. It can be, a, it's a way to kind of bundle multiple things together that don't necessarily agree in type or size. Okay, and one last thing that's related to this, when you do read in a data set, like we're going to be doing soon, when you use something like uh, read.table to take a text file that you have on your hard drive and read it in as a data set that you can play with in R. There's multiple functions for reading in data. We'll talk about some of these as we get to them. Three main ones, depending on the type of, of the format in the file. When you do this, when you read in a data set, uh, you will get a fancy version of a matrix that is called a data frame, and it's actually a list. So if I were to uh, I'll show you that as, as we get there. So let me just have let me just end on, on that kind of preview. When we read in data with R, by default we're going to have what's called a data frame. Looks like a matrix, it's just an array with a certain number of rows and a certain number of columns. In each column will be your different variables. So there could be a, very, a column for name of the person in my study, a separate column for age of the person in my study, income, and so on. So I've got a character, 
um, variable. I've got numeric variables in like a matrix form, but because it's a fancier version of a matrix, it can accommodate different types. That's actually under the scenes a, a list. So that's what a list is. It's just another way to represent an object in R. It's flexible because it can accommodate different types of um, things. Over here, the reason I mentioned list is because I'm going to transform, I'm going to change the class of this kind of cryptic thing, Affy Entree, which I can't look at because it's of a special class. But it turns out if I convert it to be of class list, it becomes more usable. That's what it becomes. We took the um, list of entree IDs and HGNC symbols and we looked up the first five probe set IDs and we turned it into a list. So now if I were to assign this, let's say temp is that, I have a list. The length is five because I only picked out the first five. So if I didn't do that part, let's remove uh, this one to five and let's look up all of the probe set IDs. Now it's the 20,000 or so. And let's look at the first little bit. First 10 entries look like this. So this is telling me now that the very first probe set ID in our database, that hgu133.db thing, is this one. And that corresponds to the gene with entree ID 5982. If I wanted to look up where, what gene correspond is at the spot named 1316 underscore AT. Um, the, the, this right here is the name of the first element of temp. Temp is a list of length 20,000. Each one of the elements has a name, and the name is the probe set ID. So if I were to say names, temp, just show me the first five, say. It's just the, the names of each of the placeholders. Which means if I wanted to look up, let's say this one, what's the entree ID that corresponds to that probe set ID? I could do, let's say, um, One thing I could do is uh, z, just make up a variable name, is equal to names temp equals that probe set ID. So names temp pulls out all the names. Double equal sign, if you look at the R cookbook, it'll tell you how to, um, in a logical way, compare two things. Does this object equal that object, yes or no? Uh, there is a single equal sign in R. That's used for assignment. Like if I wanted to say Z becomes this thing, I could say Z equals this thing. Uh, I'm using an alternative way for assignment. This, in order to ask, are these two objects the same or identical as each other, I need double equal sign. There's also greater than, if you want to check whether a number is greater than, there's greater than with an equal sign after it, that's greater than or equal to. There is um, not equal to, if you wanted to ask, are these two things different? So let's try this. I'm going to do name by name, are you equal to 1438 underscore AT? Z is now a logical, a vector of logical things, so it's going to be trues and falses. Let's look at the first five. First five are all false because the first five probe sets were not equal to this guy. Let's print out some more. Here's the first ten. And 
apparently the ninth element is the one we wanted. That's one way to figure out where in this list, where on the array, is that particular probe set. Another way to do this would be to say, um, tell me, so when we printed this off, I had to look through the trues and falses and say there's true and that's the ninth element. I could make R kind of do that work for me and I could do it like um, this. Let's do, so the length of Twenty thousand ish. Um, let's do one to that number. Where the names of temp is e equal to what we want. One four three eight underscore a t. What that's going to do is first create. The vector that contains 1, 2, dot, 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 up to 19,931. And then it's going to subset that by only retaining the elements that correspond to 1438 underscore AT. And all the other numbers are going to go away. So when I run this, I'm only going to get out the number where that probe set is. So the 9 can be given to me uh, that way without me having to visually inspect this. So in your homework, like looking up BRCA1 and where is it on the Affymetrix array, you can do these kinds of things. What I would recommend is that you replace this with the um, other one that we saw, the HGU133A symbol. Well, let's just let's just do it. Uh, no, I'll let you do it because I want to cover some other stuff. This will get you there. And there's options for what to use here that will save you a step for the homework. Uh, we talked about this, I think. No, maybe not. Um, converting between, say, entree and HG and C symbol, or converting between ensemble and entree um, can be done. And I think I asked you to do that in the homework. This is an example. It's a different, the use of a different package. Homo sapiens converting um, entree IDs to HG and C symbols. So what I'm doing in what follows is making up some example entree IDs. Entree IDs just look like numbers. BRCA1 or the Affymetrix probe set ID. They're just numbers. So here's some example genes um, identified by these entree numbers. One of them is made up and not a real entree ID number. 37690, there is no 37690 entree ID. Just to see what happens. Okay. So then what I'm going to do is convert the those example entree IDs into HG and C gene symbols. Um, so let me library in this package. And let me show you this. So what's in a package? We are we have seen that we can do help package equal package name. And in this particular one, there's lots of different uh, resources. And these, again, are, are maps. So we're still talking about converting. Uh, different types of codes that we could use. The one that we're about to use uh, is org.hs.eg symbol. org.hs.eg symbol, which is a map between entree gene identifiers and gene symbols. And by gene symbols, it means HG and C gene 
protein samples. So that's specifically what I want to do. And that's the magic object to make the connection. What I'm going to do is, is look up these example entree IDs in that database. And the way I can do that, I learned this by reading the reference manual for this package, is using the mgit function. Um, mgit is a sophisticated way to look up does uh, this does, does this element live in this collection of elements? It's not yeah, it's not the easiest function to use, and it's not the easiest way to look something up. But again, I've mentioned with some with using some of these like bioconductor packages, you run into things that are um, custom classes, and you have to use their built-in functions to communicate with them. Where possible, if I want to find where in a, um, a vector a particular element is, I'm going to do it manually using this type of approach. But in interacting with some of these bioconductor packages, I have to use a fancier uh, method for doing a lookup. So this code will do looking up those example EIDs in the list of H, G, and C symbols. Let's do that and see what we get out. Class, EID symbols, it's a list. What is the length of it? Three, okay. So let me try printing it. So when we did EID symbols, when we created this, we looked up our example EIDs, and I probably need to rerun this. Let me do that because I don't think I ran it first, and now I'm going to rerun this. Okay, so now I have, kind of like what we had earlier, a list, and in each element of the list is named something, and inside that element is the name of its pair. These names are now entree IDs. These are the entree IDs I provided. So the first one is for entree ID 1, corresponds to HGNC symbol that. Entree ID 10 corresponds to that HGN symbol. That entree ID does not exist in the database. There is no gene with that entree ID. So in your homework, whenever you figure out a list of genes that are uh, related to the BRCA1 gene, um, when you find out other genes that are involved in a similar pathway as BRCA1, then you will want to do something like this, where you go look up those genes, um, either on the AFI array or uh, translate to a different gene symbol type. So this code right here will allow you to go, for example, from entree to gene symbols. And down below, this code is doing the same thing, but it's going the opposite direction. So it's saying, look up those EID symbols that we just um, got. And let me finish what we just did, actually, before I do that. So we ran this command, and we got that list. The names are all um, EIDs, or entree IDs, and the elements inside each space is the H, G, and C symbol. I'm going to unlist this. And what happens when you unlist, so um, EID symbols is a list. If I unlist it, it collapses the elements as well as it can into a vector form, like this. EID symbols is no longer a list. Can be a little easier to work 
with um, something that's just a vector like this one. This is a vector of where each element is a character. You can still have names of the elements in a character vector. So names, EID, symbols is still the EID um, numbers, but now it's in a, in a vector form. And then we're going to do this. I'm going to um, subset those EIDs. Uh, actually, the uh, H, G, and C symbols. I'm going to subset this vector of length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 to only include non-NA elements. That's something common that you would do in R. You in lo load in a data set and there's missing values. Um, you might want to extract only the cases that correspond to complete observations. So search for missing values and filter them out is a common thing to do. We're going to do that here. And the way we can do that is to say, give me EID symbols, square brackets to subset, only give me the elements for which the following is true. And here is a new command probably for us, but I can say is.na to check whether a value is a missing value. R treats missing values with NAs. If you're in a different spreadsheet uh, software or you're in SAS or something, be aware that different types of software might call a missing value something different, like a dot, like a period, or just blank. When you come into R, if there are any missing values in, in the data that you read in, you will see NAs. If you want to find them, there is the in, is.na function. X is 1 in A, 3 minus 1. Is dot in A, X goes element by element and says yes or no, is there an in A there? So if I were to do X um, where there is not an in A, I could say square brackets, as in give me everything that satisfies the following criteria. I want um, not in A. So let's, we could do it this way, is.nax equals no. Give me those. So it gave me the numbers. In the script that I'm about to go back to, I did it um, this way, which is equivalent. That exclamation point is the not operator. So I'm essentially saying, go find everywhere that there's an na and give me everything but that. Give me the same same thing. Yes. Um, I don't think you have to do anything manually with the NAs for the homework. Often R will um, do it for you. Like if you say, if there the um, task was to print off all the genes that are involved in this pathway, and it said gene 1, gene 2, gene 3, NA, gene 4, I would say 4 genes. I don't think that's going to be the issue, though. How many, how many actual results came out when you did that? Don't count the NAs. I think there's like 139 or something total, of which 4 are NA. So I would say there's 135 genes. So print it off. I, I would recommend um, do it in R using Bioconductor to find out uh, the other genes that are involved in this pathway. Print it into the R um, console and just copy paste that list of because there's a bunch of gene names. You don't don't type those in manually or anything. Just copy paste or take a screenshot would be fine. And again, this will take you the opposite direction. If I want to go from gene sim because once I've done uh, this, let me redo this code. Once we've done this, we now have that. <clears throat> so it is the 
the vector containing the H, G, and C symbols for the entree IDs that we specified. And if I want to go backwards, suppose instead of having entree IDs and wanting an H, G, and C symbol, suppose I have H, G, and C symbols and I want to go back to entree IDs, this code shows you how to do that. It's the same exact thing as above, just in a more compact way. Um, it is looking up those H, G, and C symbols that we just figured out in the database. It's a different database here. Up here it was EG symbol. That's for looking up H, G, and C symbols. This one, if I look at the help file for this package, it tells me This one's called symbol to EG. This guy is a map between uh, these guys, but it goes the opposite direction as just symbol. So symbol took me from entree to gene symbol. This is going to take me from gene symbol to entree. And if I run this and print it, I just get back what we started with. entree IDs that we found corresponding to H, G, and C symbols. Okay, I want to at least um, spend a moment telling, talking about this keg and gene ontology idea, because that's mentioned in the homework. You don't have to know everything about those to do the homework, um, but let me just uh, comment on them. When we're doing um, like a bioinformatic analysis, we have this uh, M by N matrix of numbers. And I've said a couple of times we might want to go row by row, feature by feature, and ask, is this an interesting feature? I have 10 diabetic humans, 10 healthy humans. So that would mean 10 columns. Maybe the first 10 are the healthy people, and the second 10 are the diabetic for each one of the people, I have 20,000 numbers, one number for each gene. So then a natural task would be to go gene by gene. So like, let's look at gene one. There's 10 numbers for the diabetics, 10 numbers for the healthy, and do a hypothesis test. Is the mean expression level, the mean activity level of that gene in row one different between diabetic and control? Yes or no? So suppose we do that. We do a two-sample t-test 20,000 times, and we get 20,000 p-values. And suppose that 100 of those p-values is are uh, tiny, you know, like less than 1 times 10 to the minus 8 or something. Really, really small p-values, so we feel, feel pretty confident highlighting those genes and saying they appear to be statistically significantly different between diabetics and controls. All right. So we take those 100 genes to the collaborator, to the, to the PI who paid for the study in the first place, and now his or her job is to figure out uh, how are those genes relevant to diabetes? What do these genes do? What can we learn about diabetic process from these 100 genes? One thing that would be nice is if you could, for each, for a given gene, um, say something about what it does. What processes are uh, is this gene involved in? And maybe things like where in the cell is this gene um, active? Does this gene do things with the cell wall? Or does it do things in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm or what? Or where, does it, where is it active? What does it do? So there's a couple of different ways to try to answer those questions. That's not an easy question, because one gene might do multiple things. Um, and there's lots of things that are done in the cell you know, location. So you could have that every single gene does something specific. But in terms of learning you know, uh, a story, you would like to be able to say, for example, this gene is involved in such and such biological process. And here's a list of other genes that do similar things. This keg and the related gene ontology stuff, 
that is mentioned below are um, two ways to do this. For a given gene to provide um, like structural higher level information about what that gene does. So in the script, there's code that you can, I think, for the most part, just adapt um, for the homework to say, given a gene, here's a gene with a particular entree ID, let's go get this type of information for that gene. Um, keg is one way to provide this type of information. And Let me come up here. So it stands for this. And it is a database containing high level functions for a biological system. It tells us, actually, I'm going to go tells us this, but Keg tells us um, some useful things. For example, this is one Keg pathway that shows up in the example code here. So I use the word pathway. What I mean by that is um, genes don't act at, like totally autonomous actors in the, in the body. They act together often. They might act in what's called a network, as in um, when, one, when a signal comes in, like we've been exposed to radiation machinery turns on, turn on gene such and such. And when that gene turns on, it, it facilitates a chemical reaction that regulates another protein. And then that turns on another gene, and that turns down another gene, and so on. And you get a, a network. So that's what this is a picture of. This is a particular um, uh, pathway that's involved in one particular function caffeine metabolism, so breaking down caffeine. Whenever you drink caffeine, this happens inside of you. And what this is, is these are genes, or we can think of them either as the genes or the protein product of the gene. These genes are involved in different places when um, the caffeine is being broken down into other, to different chemicals. So these genes are here, there's other genes in different locations. And as this gene does its thing, that feeds into the next part of the, uh, of the whole cycle. Things like keg and gene ontology will pull up these types of relationships. We have our 20,000 genes, and we found 100 that looked interesting. We look up those 100 in terms of keg slash gene ontology information, and we would learn, oh, well, and this is obviously not uh, true to life, but obviously given that three of the genes I found showed up in this particular pathway, looks like caffeine metabolism is related to diabetes. So th think of um, keg and gene ontology as kind of uh, different ways of doing the same thing, which is to get high level stories about given genes, usually about genes that were selected for some reason, because we had 20,000 to start with, but these 100 look very different between the two comparison groups. So now I want to know more about those genes. Keg and gene ontology, or, or GO, are two ways of doing that. We are basically out of time. You can follow this code to actually get a Keg pathway. Um, Hopefully the comments are clear enough to get you get you going on that. Just holler on the discussion board if you need help. Go is a separate package, but it's doing similar things. Go characterizes genes in three different ways. It tells you where in the cell that protein product is located, which tells you something about what it does. It tells you a molecular function category, so that's a function in the cell that the gene's product is involved in. And then an even higher level characterization, which they call the biological process. So a biological process like um, the respiratory response or something 
would be composed of lots of molecular functions. So if there is a gene with an entry in the gene ontology database, you can learn these things about it. It's located in that location of the cell. It's involved in these functions. There might be multiple functions, multiple locations, multiple biological processes for the same gene. And again, I think you could follow the uh, code here. And then just very briefly, let me just mention what happens here. This is optional for us. But um, this, quote, enrichment idea is we had 20,000 genes. We selected 100 as being interesting because they had really small p-values comparing diabetics to healthy. For each of those 100 genes, we went and got these, these categories, this high-level um, information about them. And a, a statistics question would be, um, out of my 100 selected genes, there were all these different Go categories. So there were some genes that were involved in such and such process. There's other genes that were involved in these processes and so on. We're studying diabetes. And we'd like to know at an even higher level, are there specific processes that are consistently showing up among these 100? Is there a common high level story among these 100 genes? That's a question of, is, are, are there, um, among all the Go things that we pulled out of the database, are there some of them that are there more frequently than you would expect by chance? If diabetes is all about caffeine metabolism somehow, then you would expect, if you found 100 interesting genes and went and got this, annotate, this uh, Go stuff, you'd expect to see several entries in there that have to Go enrichment or enrichment analysis is trying to put a p-value on that. I have all these uh, things that I found from my 100 genes. I'd like to know like what high-level functions are, are apparently different between diabetics and healthy. So if I can say for my 100 genes, here's all the Go terms, and these four showed up more often than you would expect if this was just chance. There's a small p-value for these four out of my 100 Go terms. At the end of doing that, you would say, I started with 20,000 genes comparing diabetics to controls. I found 100, and I did this Go enrichment, and now I'm statistically confident that um, one of the high-level differences between this group and that group is caffeine metabolism. So you would have learned that that's kind of uh, ideal if you're doing these bioinformatics data, data analyses. Uh, you get lots of data, high dimensional data. Ultimately, you would love to translate that into like a statistical statement about a high level uh, characteristic, not just gene by gene, but at these kind of um, ontology levels you'd like to get. So just file it away. There's lots of different little applications and tasks in bioinformatics. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to give you kind of a survey of, of several of them. One is Go enrichment. We don't have time to go into it in a lot of detail. But just be aware that it is there. It's a statistical question. It is basically, if you've ever heard of the Fisher's exact test, it is an application of Fisher's exact test. You don't have to know what Fisher's exact test is for that kind of sense. All right. Questions on that? Um, next time, Friday, we're going to go to the next R script and keep talking and learning about um, some of these, uh, some of the R functionality that's available. And we'll also be learning some more bioinformatics as we go. So we're going to start talking about um, sequencing. Like, if you want to know tissue sample from a mouse, uh, what is the DNA sequence of that mouse? Uh, how do you do that? And what kind of data does that give us? Because we are going to spend a fair amount of time talking about a particular type of bioinformatic data which results from these next generation newfangled sequencing technologies. But those are fundamentally just sequencing technologies. 
So I want us to know a little bit about sequencing and how that works. Okay, see you Friday.